This is My Blend Stories, and I'm Jeff Gerlach. Kit Hard is an education technology specialist at Marysville Public Schools. Part of his professional responsibility in this role is to provide training and support to teachers, which he focuses predominantly around blended learning instruction and formative assessment. I really love having a conversation with Kit because he's always excited about some new project, some great thing that his teachers are doing, and just in general, it's refreshing to hear someone talk about what teaching and learning can be, and then go on to discuss practical pathways to making those things reality. This time around, we chatted about the collaborative PD community that he's helping to cultivate with teachers and his role in building up teacher capacity to use blended learning strategies with their students. This is his story. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Kit. How are you? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right. So, how's the end of the week going? Good. You know, I think uh, Ann Smart's McCall hangover posts probably sum it up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Definitely coming down off of the entire McCall experience. But it's been a good week, finding some time to tackle some projects. What projects are you getting into or continuing work on? Some of the things that I was working on specifically this week is just my own PD model. And um, I I have a limited amount of face-to-face time this year for really working with the staff in a real systematic way. We changed some things in the contract and when our PD occurs. So I've been offering after-school voluntary PDs as one of the ways to get folks in and share some of the different strategies and just help keep moving people along and use it as a check-in time too. Usually somebody comes in for that face-to-face PD and then that results in a flurry of emails, little video tutorials that I end up making to answer questions that they have further and then going into the classroom doing modeling kind of that coaching role, but it's, it's nice to have that touch point of face to face, but still finding the right time. There's no sweet spot, uh, with where our buildings are located and the start and the stop times between the secondary buildings and the elementary buildings. If I run a workshop too early after school gets out, then the elementary teachers can't get there. If I run it too late, then the high school and middle school teachers have really kind of moved on. They're on to the other things that they want to do with their day. So even if I'm trying to do something that I think really might have a K-12 scope or reach a lot of the different instructors at a lot of levels, it I'm, I'm usually only hitting one group or the other. Right. But I, I did do a little prototype last night. I did, a, I called it PD and your PJs. <laughs> And did an Adobe Connect webinar last night, picked a topic that I thought would be kind of suitable for more of a direct instruction model. I'm going to show a sort of a survey of Google Drive add-ons. Here's 10, 15 different Google Drive add-ons that have a lot of educational value to them. And I can display these and talk about them and then have some interaction through the chat. Or if people wanted to enable their microphones and ask questions, they could. And so I put that out there. I had tried it once last year and did it kind of in that same time frame of right after school, thinking that maybe people could stay at their desks and maybe work from home if they had to go pick up their children from daycare and be a little more flexible that way. But I really didn't get a lot of interest or buy-in. So I tried a different time. I, I offered it from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock last night. And... That seemed to be a, a better time frame. I had more interest. I was receiving emails throughout the day, people inquiring, saying, well, I may not be able to make it, but I, can I watch the recording? Or those who could make it, I had about the same. We're, we're a small district, so if I have three to six people show up for a training, that's not really a bad number. And in many ways, I like having that small group because you can be a little more 
targeted and you can really address people's questions that way. And I'm more than happy to work with one person or work with 20 people. But sometimes if you have too many in the room, it doesn't let you deviate from that track. So I had the three people who were able to make it for the actual live virtual training last night. And then I had four people, I think, who requested the recording today and got that sent out to them. And it just seems like it might be a good next step in introducing and just even helping the staff here practice that blended instruction and blended learning for themselves and experiencing it firsthand and seeing how that might translate back into the classroom. For sure. Something I really appreciate is that feeling of humanity you want in these PD sessions, like you talked about, the importance of that face-to-face interaction. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had a bunch of thoughts as you talked. The last one that I had (laughs) was this idea of catching the live show or watching the archive, interacting and actually being able to dictate the course of your live PD in the Adobe Connect session. Are there certain people that that want to have that interaction with you. And then maybe there's some people that would actually prefer to just watch it on archive or maybe watch it live, but just sit passively. Right. Uh, I, based on the emails that I got, most of the people wanted to participate in the actual live portion. Right. They said, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to make it, or I wish I wouldn't have missed it. That leads me to believe that they wanted to be able to at least interact in some way. Sure. Whether it's asking questions or saying, hey, I've tried that and being able to share. Because I think the other part of this is that as a district, we're moving along that continuum of just what is technology integration? How can I use it effectively? And we're not looking for the home button anymore in a PD. If we have to sign up and register for a new web tool, that isn't a deal breaker. People look for the little Google sign in with your Google account if it's there and quickly get signed in or they put in their first line, first name, last name and their email and we're off and running. And two years ago, that might not have been the case. Yeah. And people are using technology in their classrooms and they are trying some strategies to engage learners and they want to share some of those things. So even in the chat last night, Some of the teachers who maybe had tried a couple of these Google Drive add-ons already with students were able to share that a little bit. For instance, say Fluberoo. And one of the teachers said, hey, I love it. This is a really great add-on. And it's been really a great way for me to collaborate with the teacher across the hall. And we're dividing up some of our assessments. And we're giving students that really immediate feedback on what we're asking them to learn about and being able to be more responsive. And then another teacher's asking questions because maybe they're using Moodle more as the way that they're doing those assessments and wondering about the value. And that dialogue is really valuable. And and those teachers want to share. And for the most part, I want to be able to get out of the way. I think that that's the most important role I have in this coaching position is I can start the conversation and provide these touch points. And occasionally I even have information that's really new or kind of at that place where most people might not be yet. But on the whole, there's usually somebody else in the room who has just as much information, maybe even more. And the best thing I can do is try to elicit that out of them. Right. And so that live interaction is when that can really happen. And I liked that there was some of that happening last night and even that other tools were being shared that I wasn't planning to discuss, but that fit within that. What a great formative assessment. You know that you're making a connection if something that you've shown is relevant enough that somebody can say, here's something that's very, very similar and might even be better. Let me put that out to the group. That's really cool. So you started off with, I don't, I don't even know what they call them now, the extensions for right. apps, drive, whatever, right? Did you have a, an assessment, formative or summative theme for the whole thing, or was it a couple of things you just wanted to share? This one was more of a smorgasbord, gotcha. you know, welcome to the buffet of add-ons slash extensions. And let me share some of the, the ones that seem to be surfacing and really just keep it in people's awareness that that list of of applications is growing and changing 
and that we're starting to be able to customize something like Google Drive a lot and make it even more personalized for students if it's the accessibility tools like Read and Write for Google or the speech recognition tool or if it's some of those annotation tools, ways of getting citations into your work or properly adding Creative Commons licensed work, etc. It's giving that toolbox and embedding the toolbox inside of this larger tool. I do most of my trainings around this focus of either blended instruction or formative assessment and try to look at strategies and approaches first and then say, here's a tool that really could support it. Yeah, my perception was that it's kind of like you you have these strategies that they could be used for and you put forth like a thing that you found that could be effective for this. But I like how you don't get too obsessed with making sure that you have a variety of tools that do the same thing because you're relying a lot on the teachers to like come in, see where your mind's going with this pedagogical purpose. You're attaching a tool that would be good just to give them a starting point so that you can It's a practical example, right? Like a lot of times we struggle as leaders in blended or technology integration and stuff like that, wanting to take a content pedagogy first approach to design. I've been finding a lot lately that like you do need to model tools a little bit. Sure. We don't just have to say, okay, let's schedule a meeting where we only talk about what we're trying to do with formative assessments and not talk about tools yet. Um, I think my thinking was very much like that. I think I've evolved lately to understand that it's like, it's way more messy than that. And we can't like disconnect <laughs> content and pedagogy from technology use. Like they ever right. flow with each other. Right. That whole TPAC model is really, you have to weave them through each other. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I want to jump back to Flubber or Fluberu real quick. Um, uh-huh. Where the teach you said the teachers were collaborating on assessments, uh, formative, summative, whatever uh, in <laughs> with Google Forms and they were building them together. Yes. Were, were they aggregating student data from the same assessments that they were building or were they having copies for each of them? It, it depends. Sometimes they're doing the copy method because they want to be able to just see their group of students data in isolation, right. be able to look and say, okay, about 60% of the class really could use a reteach around this idea. The example is a school that's, again, fairly small, two teachers in a grade level. So they share those results with each other, even if they do do the copy method. But then there are certain assessments where they just let the data kind of merge together between the two groups and kind of look at it as an entire grade. Right. It seems like everyone's pretty close to where they're comfortable, like stepping on top of each other and look, looking at each other's stuff. If you're like Mm -hmm. comfortable enough to build the front end of an assessment together, you're probably comfortable enough to look at the back end results together as well. But in certain situations, in certain cultures, it might be like you need to have that copy because there's a veil that we have to put up a little bit Mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to, I mean, it it would just be all personalities and everything at that point. But I, as we're talking, I was thinking, man, because I used to use Fluber all the time in the classroom and I've recommended it to teachers that want to use forms for an assessment piece, right? Uh, I think it's, Mm -hmm. I think it's really powerful. And when you have GAF accounts turned on, a lot of times it collects the student information data itself. Whereas if you're doing it with a standard drive account and having, you know, students use their own personal Gmails and everything, you really have to lay out the forms to say name, hour, you know, whatever, like the identifiers, Um, email address so that I can email it back out to you and everything like that. But I never thought of doing it with multiple teachers before because then you can make a form identifier for students to select who their teacher was so yep. that so that you could identify whose students are whose, right? Yeah, you could just make that a drop-down menu and say, okay, I'm in 5A or I'm in 5B, and then you can be doing those sorts in the spreadsheet to look at the information by right. groupings and things like that. So then you could get your personal feedback for your students in general. But then right. that, obviously the point of merging it together would be, you know, you have a bigger sample size. You can start to identify which 
items might be in need of revision or which right. items are doing particularly well and analyze the responses that you're getting and, and so forth. No, that's just, sorry to, sorry to geek out for a moment on there. That was No, just that's okay. Me. And it, it's interesting though, too, because we also have a lot of Moodle users in our district. I say a lot, but <laughs> it's probably not that many, but I'm a fan of it. And I think there's some powerful parts of it. And on that same note, there are two teachers in two separate buildings at the fifth grade level who have been collaborating on building some project-based learning courses together in Moodle. And they've done things where they've taken their courses and then cloned them so that they really are assessing and teaching their students kind of in their own sandboxed classrooms. But the one course, this PBL that unit that they created, it didn't make sense to separate the students out because they wanted the students collaborating between the buildings. And so if they did do a quiz, they would still be grouped by the teacher, but you could also look at the data collectively as the entire, you know, buildings, uh, the two buildings collectively and, and, and probably see a little bit more if it's not just a matter of this group of students struggled, but that maybe the problem itself, the question itself needed some, some revision or tweaking and, and those kinds of things. So um, it really kind of speaks to that idea of just when is it valuable to find those ways to merge the data and how do you do that? And then also kind of honoring the fact that to a large degree, teachers want to be able to just work with those students that are near and dear to their hearts and get right down to it and let's fix this or let's let's celebrate the successes and then let's keep going. Yeah, near and dear to their hearts would be, you know, how can we use this information to to identify gaps in learning and then fill those gaps, right? I mean, right. the primary but, purpose. But that collaboration kind of PLC model is geared towards how can I improve my practice? Right. So not just improving student learning, but also improving my own instructional practice and using those platforms to kind of figure out where those tweaks could be implemented. Yeah. So I, I think it's kind of been an interesting week in that regard, just thinking about some of those models and where we've been going and uh, even just in we're at this point in the school year where we were evaluating my role in the district and the impact that I'm having. And I think technology integration specialists or coaches finding ways to quantify or measure what we're doing is, is tricky and wondering, well, am I having an impact here? What, what are the things that sort of, confirm that. So, you know, not to get too meta into just this role or what we're doing it. Any district that's trying to integrate technology is also trying to figure out if it's working. Right. Whether you have somebody who can coach it or it's just the teachers who are trying to do it. And because we're somewhat overly focused sometimes on the summative results of these these big standardized tests as the way it's it's not always easy to just kind of draw a straight line we put a device here and the output was a higher test score over here if we use tpac as that model like it, all these factors um and those are just like three leading factors right like mm -hmm. you start unpacking <laughs> that's funny uh unpacking <laughs> each one of those uh those components of it and you've got a lot of different variables that are in interplay with each other you change one it changes it changes the other so yeah without going too meta into it how are you it sounds like you're establishing evaluation criteria not necessarily for your position but like for the impact of your position right i think we're starting that conversation i still feel somewhat uncertain about how do we really know and one of those things that came up was just when we look at maybe the adoption level of technology. We talked a little bit about blended learning platforms. So if it's Moodle or Google Classroom or Edmodo, what percentage of our teachers in a building are generally using something? 
And there may be that range of how it's being used. So it could be that a worksheet's being posted as a reference point if you've lost your copy, but it then certainly goes all the way to the other end of that spectrum in which students are having more agency over the instruction. There's rich dialogue in forums and students sort of peer teaching each other or assessing each other or creating content for the classroom. And so you have that range of it too. But on the whole, as a district, we can see that most teachers are adopting some level of a blended platform from probably third grade on up for sure. And then even at the lower elementary levels, in part just because we're using some tools. We, we use MobyMax, which has this adaptive curriculum piece that has some pros and some cons to it. But what it does do is help teachers kind of take on that blended model structure of, of kind of a station rotation. You have some students who are receiving some direct instruction and assessment in a digital environment for a period of time while that teacher uses small group and individualized instruction to be a little more targeted. And then the results of that time in that digital platform are being, you know, the data is being used to then be more targeted the next week saying, okay, let's do a mini lesson around this math piece for this grouping of students so that they can, you know, do that. And in many ways, MobyMax is kind of serving as their blended platform. It sounds like injecting that MobyMax, uh, is it Max or Math? Max. It Max. used to be Math. Okay. It used to be Moby Math, and then they added an ELA component, and they're working on adding some other content areas, so now they call it Moby Max. So they're expanding their suite yeah. of what they're offering. Yeah. Cool. That's new knowledge to me. Thank you for that. Yes, that's like a component. with Like putting that station rotation model, it really becomes blended. Are there small groups then that are customized help, or is it kind of just to get the numbers smaller for when – like, I'm wondering what, it, it's going to depend. You can't say what it is every single time, right? Right. But do you see face-to-face -face standard stations in there t as well, in addition to, like, a customized help, what's bothering you kind of thing? Or how are teachers using those those other stations? Part of it is that we used a daily five model or cafe model in our language arts blocks, and it sort of emerged from that. So within a math block now, and especially the intervention, there, there might be, and it depends because the number of devices available sometimes has an impact on how a teacher has been playing with that station rotation. They might have sort of three larger groupings that they're working with. So one group is doing some of their time using the MobyMax. Another group might be doing some of the more traditional like manipulatives and physical work with math, even doing hand-worked out pieces, and then small group instruction or individualized instruction with another group, and then that kind of switches. What I'd kind of like to see this morph into, I think, is where there's even more teacher-directed content within that time on the device. Yeah. And less of a reliance on a program like a Moby Max. I think that there's some things that, whether it's front row ed or Moby Max and some of these adaptive curriculum pieces that are out there, I think there's some things that these tools can do that are very difficult for a teacher to create on their own. But I also am a big fan of project-based learning and more contextualized learning mm -hmm. and having students be in a targeted learning environment, but still applying the math in a more authentic way or applying the reading practice in a more authentic way than maybe what you get from these adaptive curriculums, digital adaptive curriculums. That's exciting stuff, Kit. I think the way that you see it is that this Moby Max, it's almost a capacity builder for <laughs> blended teachers. You know, if, if you're using Moodle or whatever you want to use as an LMS <laughs> or an LMS alternative as your home base, a digital environment that you're building yourself, it, a lot of times when you right. have teachers jump into a blended space like that and 
put them into the design seat right away. Sometimes it's like too much at once. Like it's hard to get right. an idea of what the blended environment feels like from your responsibility side of things. Right. Couldn't you see like the Moby Max being a station and then you have this ongoing project based thing as well? Yes. Some drill and practice that you got, but then you've got this ongoing project based thing that's maybe living out of you know, wherever right. you're going to put it. We don't even right. need to speak in specifics of, of where that content's going to be kept, right? Right. So kind of on that continuum, I mean, that's what I'm starting to see in some of the classrooms that I think are really pushing that envelope. They appreciate what that station of Moby Max might provide, but what they end up doing is adding in additional stations that are project-based or passion-based. There's a couple different classrooms where they really, your time on the device won't only be to do this sort of canned curriculum. And I had a teacher complain, and it was a great complaint to have. It's basically, we're one-to-one in our fifth grade through twelfth grade, but we're not one-to-one at our lower elementary. And the teacher was saying, well, now because we more or less make it mandatory to have the students spend a certain amount of time in Moby Max during the math block and that puts some pressure on the devices to move to another classroom and have those students have their time on it. The devices aren't as available at the moment for other kinds of creative uses. So to have a teacher say, but I really wish I could have the students also still have access to that device as another rotation or at another time in the day in another content area and to use that one of the things that you know happens early on with with computers is kind of the lab model or just a direct instruction right. everybody has a device everybody does the same thing and everybody does it at the same time and this has sort of forced us to view the technology as something that happens here for a little bit for a smaller group and then but everybody eventually makes their way through and when they get there there's a piece that is somewhat tailored to them and i think that the competency based models and especially because we're trying to be more standards based and standards based even in our grading that there may be some avenues for more teacher designed content in terms of letting a student kind of master a particular area and demonstrating it through some of those more creative avenues. I was working with some uh, third grade class and some of those students had really exceeded what they could do in Moby Max. So they really needed to be demonstrating their mastery in a different way. So they were making math movies and designing video story problems and kind of working off of Ben Rimes's model. And that was exciting to see um, that that teacher was ready to take on that as part of how the technology was being integrated into that station rotation model. So those students would rotate in, and when they got the devices, they were using it in a very different way. But it was really for the benefit of that community because those videos then were for the other students. Right, and so it feeds back in to what that's doing. Kind of hear a theme of like, we build in structure and rigidity so that we know what we're doing, and then we slowly... We're learning the rules and learning the ropes a little bit and really structuring this environment because we have to be. When we start moving into Mm -hmm. a digital space, we have to be very intentional so that we don't get lost and confused. But over time, you kind of remove a couple of the bars, replace some of these like requirements with inquiry. Then we start slipping into that problem-based structure. And how we keep our rigidity in that place is very naturally making that walk over to competency-based learning. And and Mm -hmm. thinking about it in a competency-based setting allows us to really put structure on the outcomes, but not in a way where it's like specific summative assessment lines, right? It's not Mm -hmm. in that way. It's like these wonderings that are created off of standards that we call competencies. If you can fill in this wondering that we have for you, we've developed a way for you to demonstrate it. And so now I could see those station rotations, they start to turn into something I've heard you talk a lot about is that huddle model where it's less about like, okay, now you go here because you already were there. It's kind of mm-hmm. like, you can go here, you can go there. It's based upon like mm-hmm. what, what you're seeing as a need and me as your teacher, as kind of a mentor figure, like, 
okay, well, what do you think's next? You think that's good? Well, yeah, that does sound good for you. Why don't you go over and do some Moby Max because you could use a little bit more of that. You think you're ready to tackle this big question that we got over here? You want to take some time to work on your project? You go, yeah. you go in that way. Oh, you see a need for something completely different that we don't have here? Create that station. Yeah, that'd be exciting. And I think that there are a couple of teachers who are really ready for that as where they would go. The constraint then is just that within the culture of a building, how do you allow some people to break away from things happening in that really linear fashion? A strict rotation is something that most people can buy into a little earlier on. Okay, it's it's now 8.30 and in the other classroom at 8.30, that group's going to rotate in 10 minutes or in 15 minutes. And I know that mine will and, and what that will look like. But I think it's a journey that we're heading down towards. Sometimes we get so excited about where it can go that we forget about the growing pains that need to take place. You need to outgrow that rigidity. There's value in that rigidity. Getting teachers to start blended learning is you have to build inertia. It's hard to get a hold, just a little toenail of uh, of right. buy-in for stuff. But it seems like your approach starts with that, let's get together and talk with your PD model and everything. And I think that there's a yeah. there's an immense sense of trust and community that you've got going on. And from a leadership standpoint to say, okay, here are some things we can do. Let's put this in place now to get us comfortable with blended learning. And particularly, these are some things that you were talking about in our conversations that we have a need for, or these are some things that I prescribe for you that I think would be good to get your feet wet and and so on and so forth. Right. I feel like you need to learn the rules in order to break them, right? Yeah. And even years back when I was in kind of the school that I worked in the longest, which was, it was called the Academic Transitional Academy, and it was a project-based learning ninth and 10th grade kind of makerspace school, although we didn't know what a makerspace was at the time. And we were very much kind of starting down that road of blended learning and we were using Moodle as our platform, but we had a lot of turnover because it was kind of a, a teacher incubator and teachers would come in, they they get exposed to a lot of really great pedagogy and, and instructional strategies and digital learning tools. And they'd build out a Moodle course for a year or two. And then, you know, it would be attractive to maybe look at another school or district and they would go. And the new teacher would come in. And one of the things that seemed to work really well was to say, well, here we have this platform and and kind of a record of that interactive space that was created for students by that teacher and we can clone that and you can hide almost everything from it but then kind of unveil it over time and sort of see what it looks like to take on a blended learning environment but be able to put your own spin on it and almost inevitably by the end of the year that teacher would pretty much ditch the course that they were handed and want to have that design approach. They wanted to customize it and make it their own. And so I see how something like what we've done with MobyMax and our K-8 has provided sort of that opportunity to take on that attitude of blended learning and that sort of mindset of blended learning, even if they have it. And, and then I have to be there explicitly kind of saying, I realize this may not have been quite what you were expecting, or maybe you're a little resistant to having to carve out that time to let your students learn in this way because you're not sure that that's the best way, but it models a type of instructional approach with technology where you're not just doing that all at the same time, everyone doing the same thing. I'm the one in charge kind of model. And really leveraging the power of this technology to let you give some independence and customization and flexibility to students, but still have that monitoring capacity and that ability to use what's happening during that time to make important changes. So, you know, we're in the first year of doing this, but that's my read on it, is that it is helping us move towards that. For lack of a better term, there's some stress with moving that way, right? Sure. You might empathize with this, but, you know, in my experience, there's what the head and the heart want aren't always Mm -hmm. like in sync. 
I work with teachers that very much want to allow students to have more control. And and like teachers really do understand that. Like like it's a mm-hmm. like it's a good thing, but then it's like you put it into practice and the wheels get in motion and it doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. Right? So like your head knows that your planning towards it was was right, but like we get into this and I feel like I'm not doing anything and, and I, I, I freak out and I just want to do a mini lecture real quick. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I want to get everyone together and make sure everyone's on the same page and everyone's good. Right. Yep. And it's not a bad thing. It's just like when you try to be less teacher centered in your design, you don't always realize how much your feedback to yourself is ingrained in you actually mm-hmm. doing things. And I don't know if you've experienced some of that. Or you can elaborate because that's kind of what you were talking about there, right? How do you massage that that situation to to kind of bring the the head and heart together? <laughs> oh, it's challenging because I think some of the variables right now in getting the head and the heart to be in agreement, like evaluations or test scores and things like that sometimes suck the oxygen out of the room when you're trying to have those conversations because you need that room for failure. You need to be able to iterate and change and sometimes step back for a little bit and go to those practices that maybe just felt like they worked in the past, something that maybe is still a little more teacher-centered, and to be able to say that that's okay. And then kind of charge forth again when appropriate and hand over the reins again. And when you're working on these designs of a blended environment and empowering students to have more autonomy over their learning, it it can get pretty messy. And I just tend to honor where the teachers are at. And in my role, I'm probably lucky because I'm neither teacher nor administrator. I don't have to dictate those things. I'm just there to kind of coach it or to say, okay, then let's go back to the way you were swinging the bat for a little bit so that we're still making some hits and then we'll adjust the swing or even adjust whether you're using a bat or a golf club or, you know, not to start mixing the metaphors too much, but. um, (laughs) (laughs) What sport am I playing? What sport am I playing? I think sometimes we're wondering what sport we're playing though. That's true. So it's okay when something isn't quite fitting, but I do think that most of the teachers really do want to help those students become more self-directed in their learning and see technology as one of those opportunities. I think that the other part of it is, is that what I'm feeling right now is that we are introducing some pretty amazing things into our educational environments there's some really great thinking out there right now in the world of education. And when you're on Twitter or reading blogs or going to conferences, you're getting exposed to just some really kind of radical ideas that really aren't that radical. They just make sense. And then you've got these pretty powerful devices that are available and this connectedness that's also there, but we're still not doing as much as we need to to just the overall infrastructure both in terms of Mm -hmm. when the day starts and ends what a classroom you know looks like we have very walls and desks and all of these things that really are not well suited to a lot of this great thoughts and these powerful technologies they're hamstrung by them to a large degree so i'm trying to see where can we shift and pivot some things in in that way and i i don't know that i have a lot of control over those factors but i like advocating for some of them yeah and saying we don't have to have this room or this building look exactly like it did and it's not just a visual thing either it's a you know structurally in terms of time and and other kinds of, you know, whether a student has to be in their seat or out of their seat or in a room or out of their room and location and those kinds of things that we could be playing around with a little bit more. I always take it from the perspective of these classrooms that we're in 
are a war era and you know industrial <laughs> design they are really functionally designed well for the type of learning that took place for half a century uh, dissemination of knowledge sit and get instruction i mean that's the reason why you have chalkboards whiteboards smart boards you know they they're, they all serve the same function in the front of the classroom all desks traditionally facing towards those the, the center of learning right and <laughs> it's like if we look at it from that perspective uh, cuz a lot of people say the furniture and, and the building and everything shouldn't matter you can encourage whatever kind of thought you want and and to a certain extent i would say that's mostly right ideas are fluid and ideas mm-hmm. can overcome a lot of obstacles if you believe enough in them to make them work mm-hmm. but but if we're going to like if we're going to exist in this environment once upon a time a lot of thought was given to designing classrooms oh. in that manner when you design new classrooms today exactly like that it's not a lot of thought to the actual learning anymore as it once was it's a lot of thought to this is what a classroom looks like so it becomes just mm-hmm. like we're producing stuff from a paradigm that no longer fits these hulking buildings that were built in the 50s 60s 70s that that were in um or even you know up into the 90s 2000s they're not going away we're not going right. to say we're doing competency based learning let's demolish this building that we built 7 right. years ago right but at the same time you can't say man we got this building that we built 7 years ago we can't do competency based learning because cuz of walls man you know <laughs> like yeah. it's one of those things where it's i definitely appreciate what you're talking about with that it's a complicated situation where we have to mention it because we're doing a disservice to the craft of wanting to do project inquiry based stuff in a competency model putting students in the creative driver seat and really making learning the top priority and not time and pace and and all that and stuff, that kind right? of circles back around just to my little experiment this week in terms of offering pd in a virtual platform but then having some face to face time as well and letting people access things asynchronously and as adults we come to expect that our day and our learning and our family lives and all of these things might start to overlap in some very interesting ways and sometimes again you know it they come into conflict but when you are open to the idea that where you learn and where you teach and when and why and all of those things can be more fluid it really does start to change your own sort of outlook on it your mindset on learning and then you start to seek that out for your students i think too or seeking that out even for your own children i seek this out now for my children i want my children to learn in a real variety of ways and i want that to be honored by our educational system and so if they're not at school for a particular day and we're taking a trip because my schedule doesn't fit my children's schedule but it's still a learning experience and there's still a lot of powerful things that happen during that time how does that all start to kind of converge and not necessarily result in anxiety for the educational system in that that period of time where the learning wasn't being inserted you know the week of april fifth there was a certain certain learning that was supposed to happen during that time and if it didn't happen during that time when we get to the point where we measure it we're we're going to be in trouble and i i think we can move away from that and you know that's why i also am drawn to things like competency models and such that sort of say we don't just learn a skill at a certain date we we learn it when we're ready and it's certain, reinforced over time and reinforce it over time and i i think that there's a lot of movement towards that but again some of the structural pieces of our buildings and our times are are still kind of gunning against that yeah uh, the success of that so um well hey man i Jeez, i thoroughly appreciated having this conversation with you today yeah me too thank you I, so much yeah 
I want to, I want to thank you. Um, you're an extremely humble guy and represent a lot of what is good in education. Whenever I talk to you, you always want to deflect the great work that's being done onto your teachers and, and rightly so. They're the ones that are bringing it to life, right? Mm-hmm. So I wanted to thank you in a way that I think you could appreciate. I want to thank you for giving an opportunity to these teachers that you work with to find themselves in blended spaces, to be a support mechanism for them to figure it out in a way that it's going to be unique to them so that they have 100% ownership in it. And thank you for modeling the, the way that you structure your PD is the way that blended instruction should be. It's messy, it's complicated, but it should be focused on people and learning. And I think that you do a great job of bringing in a lot of robust digital support to PD while keeping ideas and people at the center of all of it. So even though I've never seen, I mean, I, I've seen your interactions with some of your teachers because at, at McCall, we got an mm-hmm. opportunity to do that. But the way that you describe this stuff, I think it's awesome the opportunity that you're presenting to them. Um, and you're not necessarily like 100% sure of exactly what that is because they've got to figure out a lot of it for themselves. Um, but, but thank you for doing what you're doing. I think it's, I think it's profoundly helpful. And if you can take credit for anything, I'd like you to be able to take credit for that. Awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, man. We'll, we'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Enjoy the weekend. Okay. You too. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to My Blend Stories. For more, visit myblend.org.